Kwai Kwai, and Louise Cheryl Savageau on Nobusqua Abenaki. Hello, I'm Cheryl Savageau. I'm an Abenaki poet, writer, and textile artist. I've been a fellow at McDowell three times, for which I am deeply grateful. McDowell is situated on the unceded homeland of the Abenaki people. We have lived here for at least 15,000 years from the time of the last ice age, and we have resisted and survived 500 years of colonialism. Abenaki means dawnland, as it's the first place in North America to see the sunrise every day. Ulyoni, thank you to the dawnland and to the Abenaki people. Ulyoni, thank you to all the peoples of the dawnland, the Wabanaki of Maine, the Wampanoag, the Mahican, the Nipmuc, and all the other dawnland people. And to all the peoples, human and other than human, great thanks. Uli de Goangon, Kitsi Uliuni. Good evening. We're very grateful, Cheryl, for that beautiful land acknowledgement. And now, thanks to all of you for joining us tonight at the McDowell Benefit, an event we're calling Met at McDowell Creative Collaborations. I'm so glad to be here with you virtually and to be the host for this evening, where we will be considering McDowell collaboration and what it means to share space, physically or ideologically. We're also, hopefully, going to raise a bunch of money. I'd like to thank tonight's benefit chairs and patrons for making this evening possible, as well as tonight's business sponsors. Thanks to these individual and business contributions, we will be able to broaden the reach of McDowell's program and continue to remove barriers to participation for the residency program. You'll hear more about our program later, but first I'd like to talk about my experience of meeting collaborators at McDowell and what it has meant to my life over the years. My closest friends are actually friends who I met at McDowell. These are poets and fiction writers and artists, friends who I still have dinner with, friends who I share poems and stories with. So if you want to continue supporting the arts or if a work by a McDowell Fellow in tonight's program moves you to donate, I'd like you to look just below me on the screen. All you have to do is simply text 516-788-8525 the words give plus the amount, I like the amount $500,000, and your name and a message. We have an online auction open until this time tomorrow where you can bid on a variety of levels from signed works by McDowell Fellows to book club appearances or life coach workshops, tickets to premieres by fellows, and even the famed McDowell cookies fresh from our kitchen. The link to the auction and text giving numbers will be available throughout the evening. I'll be with you throughout the night, but for now, I'd like to introduce McDowell Fellow and architect Peter Zussman, who has a few words about the National Sawdust Space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where much of the program tonight was filmed. It sits on unceded Lenape land, as do the McDowell offices where we are today. Welcome to National Sawdust. I'm Peter Zussman, co-founder and principal of Bureau V Architecture and a McDowell Fellow. Like McDowell, National Sawdust was built to be a home and a place for the collaboration of artists. Since its founding, it has been a labor of love that we've worked on for eight years from the beginning when we first shook the hand of its founder to the day it opened. Early in that process, we integrated many, many conversations with working artists from multiple disciplines, from music, from composition, from dance, to try to understand what a space like this needs to do for a community of artists. We came upon retailing and retooling an 18th century chamber hall model. What you're seeing behind me is an acoustically transparent but visually opaque skin of perforated metal and speaker fabric. Behind this wall sits about 18 inches of airspace, which we fill with a number of variable acoustic treatments. That allows for us to entirely change the way the room sounds based on the instrumentation that the artist is bringing into the room. So if we're listening to a drone metal show, we will pull all those curtains as much as we can to absorb that onslaught of sound. And if we're listening to a string quartet, we'll draw all those curtains and allow this room to be as bouncy and live as possible. That wall that's bouncing back is about eight inches thick of solid concrete, all sitting on springs then a two inch air gap, then 12 inches of solid concrete that wraps this entire space. 
In 2014, I was lucky enough to stay at McDowell. And during that time, the construction of this project was well underway. And it was an amazing moment for me to take a break and think about the future of my career, as well as this space just before it opened. In keeping with the spirit of this space, as well as McDowell, we collaborated with Paolo Persini, the composer and artistic director of uh, National Sawdust, to curate a series of performances in this space. It started with the day we broke ground and ended just before we opened. In that spirit, we were able to bring in a number of artists to leave ghosts of artworks in this space long before it opened and to let sound fill these walls long before they were really here. National Sawdust is really a jewel in New York City and a home for the creation of new music. And we're very excited that you're here. Hi, Nell. Hi, Philip. Look at this. I know, and thank you, Peter, for welcoming us to this amazing space. Yeah. I'm Nell Painter. I'm Madam Chairman of McDowell, and I want to welcome you to the 2021 McDowell National Benefit. And I'm Philip Himberg, Executive Director of McDowell, and I'm fortunate to partner with Nell and with our McDowell staff and our Board of Directors, all of whom welcome you tonight. We are thrilled to take this opportunity to share news of McDowell and to celebrate our artists, our McDowell Fellows, with friends and supporters, and with those of you who we hope will get to know us more this evening. McDowell is one of our nation's first artist residencies. Founded in 1907 by husband and wife Edward and Marion McDowell, the McDowells had a vision, and they fulfilled it by creating a haven for artists in Peterborough, New Hampshire, a place for talented artists to ponder, imagine, and to take risks. And this all happens on 450 bucolic and inspired wooded acres where there are 31 separate artist studios. And each year around 300 artists who apply and who are accepted inhabit those spaces to make new work. Since McDowell began, more than 15,000 residencies have taken place and artists come free of charge and from all over the globe. They are provided studio space, all their meals, and maybe best of all, a diverse, creative community working across multiple artistic disciplines, visual art, writing, music, theater, architecture, filmmaking, and more, 365 days a year. One of the very special gifts about McDowell is dinner. <laughs> I mean, it's breakfast and lunch too, but dinner. And at dinner, all the artists come together across all these different disciplines, and people get to meet other people, and they learn to collaborate. Tonight, you'll also hear from Urban Word as we honor this remarkable organization as the second recipient ever of the Marion McDowell Arts Advocacy Award. We give this award to an organization that aligns with McDowell's mission. It feels to me that now more than ever, and I think you would agree, Nell, our model of fulfilling our mission is vital. We're in a complex moment right now, awash with indifference, awash with imbalance, and with fabricated fears of the other. And a place like McDowell at this moment offers time and space for artists to experiment, to take risks, to discover, to promote empathy, and ultimately to lead us all as great art and great artists always do. The last two years have really provided unique challenges, but also opportunities to learn how we, we can powerfully contribute to the artistic landscape of our country and the world. Um, much of what we do has to do with access and significant transformations are taking place at McDowell. Our founding mission remains at the core, but we are also asking ourselves questions to ensure that artists who may have been historically less represented at heritage institutions like McDowell have access to the wonders of McDowell. McDowell fellow author James Baldwin once wrote, when you are writing, you're trying to find out something which you don't know. The whole language of writing for me is to find out what you don't want to know, what you don't want to find out but something forces you to anyway. And so our recent work at McDowell has been to understand what we do not know. What has the McDowell community learned 
Well, one recent example is McDowell's decision to drop requirements on our applicants needing to provide professional references. This shift eliminates inherent inequities and encourages more talented artists to consider applying to McDowell and making it their home. One of the remarkable things about McDowell, just one of the remarkable things about McDowell, is that artists don't have to pay to come. Uh, and there are, in addition, free fellowships for those who need some additional help. None of this, none of this would be possible without your help. We approach foundations and corporations who support us, but individuals like you are absolutely crucial. We need your help for the artist, and we also need your help for that sense of contributing to our community. Hopefully next year we will be gathered together in a real space next to each other, side by side. But until that time, we'd like you to enjoy this short virtual program highlighting the work of McDowell Fellows. Here we go. And if you can, please give generously. Thanks. Sharon Graytack, a filmmaker. I adore McDowell, I really do. It's a perfect place for, for filmmakers because there are other disciplines there, you know, and there's a lot of exchange of ideas and work. You spend at least several weeks there, so you, so you really get to know each other. The first collaboration was with a composer named Wes York. It was like perfect, you know, sort of filmmaker-composer. I was concerned that I don't know the language to collaborate and with a composer, um, but we, we used like tons of adjectives. I would say something and Wes would say, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know, you know, I can, I can get that. And he would have ideas and say, let me try this. Um, so it was, it was an incredible, incredible uh, collaboration. Being at McDowell, I really felt that I could take risks, a lot more risks. You felt you had the luxury of time and uh, uh, to make mistakes. It's not just about producing the work, it's really about, you know, becoming um, much more centered and, and uh, able to approach the work and have, and really have the work speak back to you. Dinner or breakfast can be a place where you might run into someone and have a chance to say a few words or have a conversation. But then there's something different that happens when two artists walk between these places. Sometimes we reveal to each other parts of our lives that don't come up at the dinner table, and they certainly don't come up when you're in your studio. We're all artists trying to produce something to reveal something about our lives or the world. Thanks so much, Sharon, for sharing your work with us. It is now my pleasure to introduce poet, author, and McDowell Fellow, John Maria, who we'll also see a little bit later in the program. My name is John Murillo. I'm a poet, and I was at McDowell November into December of 2016. Being around other serious artists, right, was fuel for me, right? It was inspiring, so it was a good time. That's something also very important about that dinner time. You get a chance to um, commiserate, yeah? And um, you know, some days the work was going well, some days it wasn't. And it was an opportunity sometimes to talk each other um, off ledges, right? Um, and sometimes you can talk through your own, your own struggles and end up solving your own problems. There's this mythological structure. It's way, way, way out in the woods. So you have to actually journey to go. The Oracle, that's what they call it. It was um, an old outhouse that wasn't in use. The idea is that you'd go there with your questions, you just reach in, pull out the answer, and that would be the answer to whatever you're going through. You'd write down, I don't know, there's nothing in fear but fear itself. Throw it in there, right? And then five years from now, someone goes there struggling with something they're going through, and the answer to their problems would be, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Not long after my uh, visit to McDowell, actually, um, I went back to Los Angeles to help bury my grandmother. Drove out to visit one of my old neighborhoods, and the building wasn't there. It made me think about home, fluidity, permanence, impermanence, and this poem came out of that. 
The poem is called Mercy, Mercy Me. And if you know Mercy, Mercy Me, you know the next line is Things Ain't What They Used To Be. It's a song by Marvin Gaye. Mercy, Mercy Me. Crips, bloods, and butterflies. A sunflower somehow planted in the alley, its broken neck. Maybe memory is all the home you get and rage where you first learn how fragile the axis upon which everything tilts. But to say you've come to terms with a city that's never loved you might be overstating things a bit. All you know is there was once a walk up where now sits a lot vacant and rats in deep grass hide themselves from the day. That one apartment fire set back in 76 one the streets called arson to collect a claim could not do ultimately what the city itself did left to its own dank devices some 16 years later rebellions said some riots said the rest in any case flames and the home you knew ash it's not an actual memory but you remember it still, a rust-bottomed Datsun handed down, then stolen, stripped, recovered, and built back from bolts, driving away in May 1992. What's left of that life quivers in the rear view, the world on fire, and half your head with it. My name is Rafael Xavier, and I am a dancer, a breaker to be more specific. When I was at McDowell in 2014, my idea was to create a new piece called Chattel that was specifically designed for museum, gallery, and art spaces. But what I ended up doing was seizing the moment of opportunity there, and I ended up painting and making videos and working with some of the other artists that were there. I didn't go in with any expectations. I went in there to challenge myself with three weeks to play and come up with something and then meeting people who I've never met before gave me the opportunity to push a little bit more and like challenge myself. In 2007, I had a spine injury where my vertebrae was swelling and squeezing my spinal cord. I kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and when I finally went to the doctor, they were like, yo, man, you need to stop. I always get like a weird emotional at that point. Because stop is not something I'm interested in doing. And so, being at McDowell, stop was not an excuse. I just kept making stuff. While I was trying to figure out my painting world, I was dancing and painting, so I would put the paint on me, and I would put the canvas on the floor so I could paint six different pieces at one time. And there was another young lady, I do not remember her name. She said that it would be interesting if it was on plexiglass because you could see through both sides and what you did on one side, if you flip over, that might actually be better. She gave me a giant piece of plexiglass that was, you know, pretty cool and it was a smoother surface. Got home and I continued to paint and I ended up having a three month painting exhibit City Hall invited me to put some of my work in their art gallery. I got a USA Fellowship with Guggenheim. I recently just made a film. So I just do all these things with McDowell artists in mind. By supporting McDowell, you are supporting those relationships and helping new artists to thrive. And that's why I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has given so far. McDowell Fellows collaborate in residence, but also in the world after. Musician and McDowell Fellow Shana Taub is working with several other fellows, including Mimi Lian, 
and Grace McLean for her forthcoming musical Suffs, premiering at the Public Theater. At National Sawdust, we filmed a performance from Shana's musical with Nikki James, accompanied by Andrea Grody, for you to view now. I'm Shana Talv, and I was lucky enough to go to McDowell in 2012, and I feel like my time at McDowell impacted my creative practice in two really important ways. One was just the sense of discipline to self-structure time for several weeks to be writing in this regular, immersive way. And the other is the sense of community, just getting to spend time and break bread with other artists over dinner every single night and to have that sort of ritual gathering. Cultivating those rituals to keep the creative spirit alive in a group of people is something that I really thrive on and feel like I found at McDowell. This piece that we're sharing a song from tonight, it's called Suffs, and it's about the American women's suffrage movement, specifically in the decade leading up to the passage of the 19th Amendment. And it's all about how a community comes together, both in success and failure, trying to make big structural change. Wait, my turn. When will you white women ever learn? I had the same old talk with Susan B. Twenty years ago, I thought you might be better, but you still don't know. Do you not realize you're not free until I'm free? Or do you refuse to see? Well, it's not my job to teach you, but it seems to have fallen to me. You want me to wait my turn to simply put my sex before my race. Oh, why don't I leave my skin at home and powder up my face? Guess who always waits her turn? Who always ends up in the back? Us lucky ones born both female and black. Who wait my turn? Well, I sure don't see you waiting yours. No, you're preaching. We demand it now while knocking down locked doors. But you want me to wait my turn so you don't defend your southern base. Since when does a radical roll over for bigots in the first place? That's not leadership, Alice. That's cowardice. Would you quote Frederick Douglass on your soapbox, intending to include and impress us? When in the press you play down our involvement And here behind closed doors you attempt to suppress us Deeds and not words as the button on your jacket I'm so sick of rhetoric with no action to back it If you don't have the spine to stand with us now What will it take? You do have a choice, there's always a choice Which one will you? to wait my turn in truth it's not your call either i march with my own state delegates or i don't march at all i'm not here to soothe your guilt that is none of my concern i won't beg for your approval that i shouldn't have to earn so no matter what you tell me i will not wait one more minute for my turn. Thank you, Nikki, Andrea, and Shana, as we keep looking at the ways McDowell's community of artists collaborate and sustain one another. I'd like to remind you all that you too can be part of this community by collaborating on a gift of money to sustain McDowell. By donating via the number below me on the screen or checking out our silent auction, which is open until this time tomorrow, you will be sustaining McDowell's artists for years to come. There really are so many amazing items, including weekend trips to Peterborough area and book club appearances by fellows. We really do hope you will participate tonight. Gifts of any size or amount. Our next artists who met at McDowell collaborated and are now being married in the spring are Anne Beale and Christopher Zuar. I'm Anne Beale. I am an animation artist. I have lots of ideas and I generally express them through animation. 
through painting, really. McDowell was a haven for me. I was there with some amazing, amazing people, and listening to them and learning about their lives gave me the space to talk about what I was going through and to talk about my life. I was at a pretty vulnerable place. I was feeling like, can I make this experimental animated film about my experience with mental illness? Can I make, like, does anyone want to hear from me? Like, is this a valid experience? And the resounding answer was, yes, <laughs> it is a valid experience. It's so easy to be afraid and to live in fear. I just want to stress how important it is to be open and to be willing to make mistakes and to be willing to say something stupid, you know, and to be willing to be vulnerable. There are a lot of teaching moments in McDowell, a lot, and I think that's so important and it just has to be a safe space for creativity. In order for creativity to flourish, it has to be a place where you can say what's on your mind and, and receive grace. At McDowell, you often have older, more experienced artists who are further along in their careers, mentors to the younger people. And that's how McDowell builds community. I think the first thing that I was attracted to with Chris was musically and artistically and like that same kind of like mathematical brain. I tend to think in instead of base 10, I think base 12. <laughs> and he's thinking like, you know, one measure could be four seconds. I did not go to McDowell expecting to meet a life partner. My name is Christopher Zuor. I'm a composer. Anne screened two films at McDowell, and I just remember connecting to the work immediately. There was like the surface level beauty of the image, the elegance of the, the motion. Her sense of color is just really, really attractive um, and unique and organic at the same time. It resonated somehow emotionally that there was like something very deep underlying these beautiful images that I was seeing. Within that moment, I knew that there was something there. I just knew that we would, we would collaborate someday. We were really sort of careful to even combine our artistic practices at all because we're both very artistically independent. Tonal Conversations is a long form collaboration that started at McDowell and is still going to this day. This was my first collaboration with any other artist. Anne is a musician, so I think she really understands musicians. And that's been one of the joys of collaborating with her is that she can speak on my level. I can't always speak on her level, uh, but she can certainly speak on my level, and that's, um, I think that's really freeing. It's been really, really good for both of us as artists because we can challenge one another's artistic, like, habits. He has specific things he does sometimes that's like, it, part of it is his musical language, but sometimes I point it out and say like, yeah, well, that's where you have a little breakdown. Like, that's where you have your, like, musical tantrum. And then I do, he does that to me sometimes in my animation practice where he can say, well, yeah, but have you thought about maybe cutting to this other scene? Or like, you've really, you've been pretty obsessed with like the color blue for, for a while. Like, what's that about? McDowell allowed me to put aside my day-to-day -day life and just like fully engage and immerse myself in my work. I got to spend a lot of time with great jazz pianist and composer Fred Hirsch. He's one of my great musical heroes. And when Fred arrived at McDowell, it was like uh, just this great vehicle for, for starting a friendship. And I hope Fred wouldn't mind me mentioning that his music, it's unabashedly beautiful. It's just, it's him. That's something to really strive for, it's just like honesty. 
Now please re-welcome McDowell Board Chair Nell Painter, who will introduce the Marion McDowell Award along with McDowell Fellows John Murillo and Patricia Smith. This year, the award is generously underwritten by Musa and Tom Mayer, as well as by the DuBose and Dorothy Hayward Memorial Fund. Collaborators who met at McDowell, married, shared several residencies together, and whose work directly inspired the American classic Porgy and Bess. The DuBose and Dorothy Hayward Memorial Fund has donated close to $4 million over 36 years to McDowell, and their support continues to sustain new artists' growth and collaborations today. I'm so pleased to present the Marion McDowell Arts Advocacy Award tonight. In response to these pivotal times, we introduced the Marion McDowell Arts Advocacy Award to shine a spotlight on individuals and organizations doing the important work of championing artists so that artists can make the world a better place. Hello everyone, my name is Patricia Smith. Contrary to the belief of nearly everyone, there is a place beyond magic, a place beyond miracle, a place beyond majesty, and that is where Mahogany Brown resides. Along with her role as Urban Words Artistic Director, she is Executive Director of Just Media. She is the face of Urban Word, headquartered in NYC. Urban Word is inarguably one of the country's most electric and influential youth arts organizations, a fierce and formidable community of poets, activists, and educators who write the rules when it comes to the unstoppable force we've come to know as spoken word. So many of the young writers and performers I continue to learn from have perfected their craft at Urban Word. Because of Urban Word, more than 25,000 youth between the ages of 13 and 19 find the tools, the training, and the welcoming spaces to voice and own their own stories and to take leadership roles in their communities convincing the tentative that every single voice, every single story is legitimate and worth its weight in words. I think the mission of Urban Ward isn't so different from that of McDowell. Urban Ward clearly is working with um, youth, but it's about community, right? It's about providing a space where artists can come together and see themselves as artists and to see other artists and get a sense of what that is. Thank you for all you do, Mahogany L. Brown, and for the great work of Urban Word. It is an honor to receive this award on behalf of Urban Word. Since 1999, the mission of this organization has always centered around youth voice, youth engagement, youth mentorship, and youth literary excellence. In a time where we are constantly battling the effects of silencing, voter suppression, mass incarceration, and the results of climate change, we must listen to our young people. They've been leading us towards a path of equity and equality for so long. We should pay attention. We should pay attention. The youth already know what time it is. Well, in all of my feelings and emotions here, we should bring up uh, the reason that we're here, really, the young people of Urban Word. Elizabeth Schwartz, a 16-year-old writer, artivist, and at the time of this recording, unbeknownst to her, is the newest NYC Youth Poet Laureate for 2022. I was taken by Elizabeth Schwartz's poem, at least. It felt like an ode of sorts to the city, right? Um, um, a young person who sees what's going on, but also um, is very hopeful that something else might be brought about, yeah? There is another reality uh, possible. I think it's fitting that she is the uh, Youth Poet Laureate. Um, when I think about what her work is doing and uh, um, what we hope for um, and really expect from our young people, Elizabeth is currently a student at Staten Island's Technical High School, a member of the Urban Word Slam team. Her poetry and activism have been highlighted by PBS, the United Nations, the Apollo, New York One, 
Grist Magazine, the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and more. An advocate through entrepreneurship, as well as art, Elizabeth is the co-founder and co-director of Bridge to Literacy, a global U.S. Department of State funded nonprofit that fosters a love of language. Through literacy-based mentorship in 100 plus youth across six continents. Wow. Please welcome to the stage, Elizabeth Schwartz. In my dreams, I am King Midas, specter, sinner, saint damned if I'm just another spectator, I swallow sunbeams. Slick lips revel in the golden glut of bustling streets. Here, they unclench their fists and let the cobblestones clatter to the ground. This is the type of city that burns its maps. A firework is a fickle attempt to bottle miracles, but God damn it, if we can't say we tried, say the mosaics here were beautiful. Iridescent, irradiate, iris, each shade of paint used at least once. Three coats fresh, but we're still going. Are you going to watch the fireworks tonight? Take your shoes off by my doorstep and stay until the dawn cracks us a smile. Stay every night until you too learn to search for paradise within the pavement. If this block were mine, I'd cradle it. All tarp swathed, termite ridden, suckling on the runoff from the American dream. We're going through a drought because they treated the neighbor's pool water with chlorine before they filled our sippy cups at lunch. If this block were mine, I'd let it go. Untether its arms from the HOA's grip until they learn how to stop letting paradise slip through their fingers and back again, soothe the cracks and crevices with cement and instead of bulldozing the bodegas for celery juice stations or the karate dojo for the soul cycle, swap the school desks for stages, keep the children's playground, keep the Russian store, keep the Perigees and Ponchiki. America promised us alimony, but we rescheduled the court date until our pavement reflects the paradise we deserve. Screw anyone who says the smog will be part of our landscape. This landscape does not need your latex gloves. Here, we do not sanitize our roots for the inspectors, for the tenants, for the pedestrians peeking in the windows as if to say, how dare we be Sri Lankan, Sicilian, Soviet strong, and yes, this is still Staten Island. Do not apologize for the cigarette ash or the chipped R's. Our parents didn't have a choice to sharpen their tongues to the tune of standard American English. So shut your mouth before you claim this block as your own. If this block were mine, I'd tear the crabgrass stalk by stalk. Before it chafes another knobbly knee, before the overgrowth curtains away the sidewalk sunbeams and hopscotch tiles, they say we should draw solid, draw straight, draw the first number that comes to mind the gap between the pothole and the picket fence. In my dreams, I am King Midas, specter, sinner, saint. Someday what I touch will turn to gold. Together, we can make this pavement paradise. That was amazing. Yeah, right on, man. What a way to end the evening. Thank you, Raphael, for joining Elizabeth and collaborating on this performance unique to the benefit. Thank you so much to everyone at home for joining us tonight and learning about our program and the work of our fellows. Please be sure to share this with your friends and family to help build the McDowell community and support the wonderful artists who need time and space to create and collaborate. We hope that you can continue to text to give, participate in our auction by the button below, and help us reach our goal of making McDowell a sustainable place for artists to meet, connect, and grow together for the next 100 years. We look forward to welcoming you back next year in person. Space and time, I think, are the greatest gift you can give an artist. From that, all kind of magic can happen. <laughs>